welcome today to all of our life churches and our network churches. Those of you who are on the other side of computer screens at Church Online, I'm really thankful to have you with us today. Uh, I'm curious, can I get a show of hands at all of our churches? How many of you all have a weak stomach? How many of you have a weak stomach? Anybody have a weak stomach? Um, you get food poisoning, throw up, throw up, anybody throw up? I, I probably have the weakest stomach of anybody who's ever lived. Probably the weakest stomach in the history of the world, okay? Uh, raising six kids and trying to change diapers, it was like the greatest test and season of my life. You could not believe how difficult it is not to throw up. And I don't throw up like a girl. When I throw, girls will kind of throw up like, oh, and they get on the scale, oh, I lost a pound, you know. No, no, I'm not like that. When I throw up, the neighbors three doors down hear me, and it's just like, it's a scene, and it's dramatic, and it's no fun at all. And so babies, you know what they do in diapers, and uh, I'll just be real honest, and, and I hope this doesn't gross you out, but if there's like, when they go number two, if there's like a, a, like a firm, balled up number two, I'm in the zone, I can handle that one, I can actually change the diaper, just knock that thing out of the way, like a cat knocks a ball out, wipey, 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 put it back on, we're good. If it's mushy, <laughs> dear Jesus, help us all, okay? If, and, and especially, you know how sometimes babies, they don't go number two, or number one, they go number three. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's like squirt stuff. And like, when that happens, I'm vomiting even before I get in the room. And I, I used to, in fact, Amy can tell you this, when I would like, you know, I'd get just barely into the diaper and I would start hurling in my mind and my body would start reacting. And, be like, mm! and then I'd try to scream Amy, but when I scream Amy, my mouth would actually be open. And so that was vulnerable to everybody. It's so like, Amy! Mm! And then she'd come running in to rescue me. In fact, when she left town, the first time when we had a couple of little kids, I actually had to call a neighbor over to help rescue me from a runaway diaper. And she was so embarrassed. She said, you know, I can't allow you to do that again. So the next time she left town, I just took Sam, my son outside, stripped him down naked, took a water hose, and just sprayed that little butt down. And that's how we dealt with it. Okay. Everybody say vomit. Everybody say vomit. Okay, you'll understand why I said that later on. Thank you for handling my confession today of dealing with number two in babies. <laughs> We're actually, thank you for working with me. It's no fun without you. We're actually in a message series called Christian Atheist. If you missed previous weeks, you may say, wait, 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 what, what is a Christian atheist? Well, what is an atheist? We know an atheist is someone that does not believe in God. And therefore, if someone does not believe in God, how are they going to live? They're going to live like God does not exist. Doesn't mean atheists are horrible people. I know some atheists that are very, very good um, contributing citizens, many of them. But we're talking about a Christian atheist. What is a Christian atheist? Well, it's a term I made up. A Christian atheist is someone who believes in God, but lives as if God does not exist. Believe in God, but lives as if God does not exist. Week number one, we talked about those who believe in God, but do not know him. Week number two, we talked about those who believe in God, but do not fear him. Next week, we're going to talk about those who believe in God, but do not trust him fully. Now, I believe in you, but I'm not going to give every area of my life to you. I don't trust in you fully. Today is my favorite of all four, and honestly, the most hard-hitting one. I want to talk about those who believe in God, but don't want to go overboard. I believe in God, but I don't want to be one of those Christians that are like fanatics, all into it, crazy about Jesus stuff. I believe in God, but I don't want to be one of those people who take it too far. In fact, today, we're going to talk out of the book of Revelation, if you want to follow me on your YouVersion Bible apps, Revelation chapter 3, and I want to give you the context of what we're going to read about in Revelation 3. Uh, in fact, in the book of Revelation, Jesus actually wrote seven letters to seven churches, or he wrote one letter to seven ch different churches, and John recorded these letters, and to six of the churches, Jesus actually said something they were doing well, and then he would correct them. There was one particular church where he didn't even give them a bone at all. He didn't say you did good here at all. He just went straight into correction and spent the whole time telling them what they were doing wrong. And that's the church we're going to look at today, a church known as Laodicea. Let me give you a little history of Laodicea. Uh, this was a very, very wealthy city. 
Uh, in fact, 35 years before this letter was written, Laodicea, uh, Laodicea was destroyed by a massive earthquake. And because they were so wealthy, they quickly rebuilt everything better than you could imagine. In fact, they were known for their massive theaters, their huge stadiums. They had these lavish public baths, which were really popular at the time. Uh, they had massive shopping centers. Imagine something like if you've ever been to Vegas, where just out in the middle of the desert, the city pops up. Or, or maybe a better example would be Dubai, where boom, I mean, there's roller coasters inside of buildings. And so during this time, it was that type of a city that was massively wealthy and had everything that you could think that you would, could imagine that you would want to live with. And this is what Jesus said to this very wealthy, very blessed group of people. Revelation 3.15, he said, I know your what? Everybody help me out. He said, I know your deeds. deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. He says, I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are what? Here's our key word. He said, because you are lukewarm, neither cold, hot nor cold. He said, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Verse 17, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Verse 20, Jesus extends the most amazing invitation. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus, talking to the people in Laodicea, he says, I know your deeds. Not I know what you say you believe, but I know how you live. And there's a difference. How we live actually reflects the true reality of what we believe. I'm not just talking about what you say you believe, but I see how you live. Jesus says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were one or the other. It's a little bit like if you drink a cup of coffee. Hot coffee's good, right? Yeah. Hot coffee's good, right? Yeah. Cold coffee's good, right? Yeah. Coffee's that have been sitting out for four hours is not good at all. We don't want lukewarm. And what's interesting, if you study about Laodicea, um, they had some challenges getting water brought to them. So they had the, these long kind of underground pipes and they would ship the water in from hot springs or cold springs. And what they wanted to do was get the water there as fast as they could because they didn't have microwaves and they didn't have refrigerators. So hot and cold drinks were a real premium. Uh, at the religious festivals, what they would do is they would serve drinks uh, before people would prepare their hearts to make the sacrifice. And so if you were an important person, if you were a noble person, if you were the most wealthy person, if you were considered highest in society, you got your drink first so that you would get one that was hot or you would get one that was cold. But if you weren't so important, you didn't get it first. You got it more toward the end of the line so it was very lukewarm. So when he used this language, it was more than just, hey, you're lukewarm. It was speaking to the fact that you're really being dishonored by being at the back and you're, you're really not even pursuing me and you're not that important in this case at all. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but instead you are lukewarm. In verse 16, let's look at it again. He says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to do what? He said, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, the word spit comes from a Greek word that's only used one time in all the Bible, and it's printed there in your notes. And this little word, it actually means to spit. It means vomit. It means utter rejection. It means supremely repulsed, okay? If you eat a bad egg salad sandwich, it's rotten, okay? What does your body do? I know it's gross, but what does your body do? Everywhere you got a hole, there's something coming out, right? Okay, you got to plug it, plug it, plug it, plug it. I mean, it's like, it, that's nasty, but it's your body. I know, I don't want to have fun with me, all right? Like, you, know, you deal with this text, you got to make it come to life, okay? It's, it, it, it's, it, your body is rejecting that, and, and it's going to come out. And what Jesus is saying is when, when you don't show any passion at all, when you're apathetic, when you are complacent, when, when you don't care, when you're comfortable in, in your pursuit, I can't, I can't stomach that. 
I reject it. I'm repulsed by it. From, from the deepest part of me, I cannot tolerate that. And I, I vomit that out. I spit that out. I spew that out. I completely, uh, supremely am repulsed by this. Now, how many of you know what an oxymoron is? Oxymoron? What's an oxymoron? It's when you take two different words that are the opposite and you put them together, an oxymoron. Act naturally. Yeah. Act naturally. Okay. Uh, genuine imitation. <laughs> How do you do that? Tight slacks. Okay. <laughs> Jumbo shrimp. Right? Uh, airline food. <laughs> Government efficiency. <laughs> Microsoft works. <laughs> Sometimes. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, per, <laughs> perhaps the, um, the greatest oxymoron in the history of the world would be lukewarm Christian. L lukewarm disciple of Jesus. Lukewarm follower of the Son of God. Lukewarm Christian. Now, what is a lukewarm Christian? Um, we could talk about all sorts of different ways to describe it, but what I thought I'd do is I just put together a list of seven qualities of lukewarm Christians. We could come up with a list of 70 different qualities, and you could make your own, but I just chose kind of based on my experience as a pastor and working with people for 25 plus years um, on spiritual issues, I chose seven of what I consider to be some of the more common issues of those who are lukewarm. Chances are when you see these different qualities, you'll think, I know somebody who's like that. They believe in God, but they don't want to go overboard. And some of you, if you're really honest, you might even say, oh my goodness, I see myself in some of these as well. So what are some qualities of those who would be lukewarm Christians? The first one, if you're taking notes, is this. They crave acceptance from people more than acceptance from God. Uh, Timothy in the Bible said, in the end days, there will be people who are lovers of themselves. And we, we live in a very real selfie-centered generation, don't we? I mean, do you like me? Do you approve of me? Do you like my shoes? Do you like my kicks? Do you like my house? Do you like my hair? Do you like my, you know, do you like that selfie? I'll give you another angle. You know, please approve of me. Please like my picture. Please, please tell me I fit in. Hey, if you don't like me, I'll conform my morals to your morals because I want you to love me. I want you to accept me. And Jesus actually said this. He said, be aware when all men speak well of you. If everyone speaks well of you, you're not really following Jesus. And yet so many of us, without even knowing it, is we're truly living for the approval of people rather than living from the approval of God. A lukewarm Christian who craves the approval of people more than the approval of God. Secondly, a lukewarm Christian rarely shares their faith in Christ. They're rarely sharing the goodness of God with other people. Why? So many reasons. We don't want to be weird. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to offend people. Honestly, I would argue at the heart of it is because we don't really believe that the power of the gospel transforms lives. Because if we really believe this, then we would get over our fears and we would pray every day that God would help us to share our faith so that we would have the fullness of everything that Christ wants us to have. And yet we don't do it. And Jesus was really clear about this. He said, if you confess me before my Father in heaven, I, you confess me before men on earth, I will confess to you before my Father in heaven. But if you do not confess me before people on earth, I will not confess to you before my Father in heaven. Lukewarm Christians rarely share their faith. Number three, lukewarm Christians rationalize their sins. Rationalize their sins. We live in a day where literally people rebrand and rename sins so it's not as bad. You know, adultery is not adultery now. It's an affair. It sounds so much better, doesn't it? It's an affair. Uh, pornography is, is what? Adult entertainment. It, I mean, it just it sounds so, so, so much better, doesn't it? Profanity is adult language. That's, you know, hey, kids, when you grow up, you can drop the F-bomb. But you're 12, so don't drop the F-bomb now. When you're an adult like me, then you can use adult language. And we're, we're rebranding and renaming sin. And so what do people do? Well, it's easy to say, uh, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. It's my life. I can do whatever I want. Who are you to judge me? Stay out of my life. I, I, I'm doing, this isn't hurting anybody anyway. And they rationalize sin all day long. Number four, 
the lukewarm Christian thinks more about life on earth than eternity in heaven. They're consumed with life on earth and not eternity in heaven. There's a guy in the Bible named Paul. He says something crazy. You know what he said? He said, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Do you hear that? I mean, like, to, to be on earth is, I mean, that's for me to represent Christ. To die I go to heaven. That's better. That's way better. I mean, this would be great. And one day I'm going to die and I'm going to go to heaven. And what do we see on earth now? I don't want to die. No, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'd rather be 105 and wear diapers than die. Okay? What do we do? We're consumed with earth. It's all about the things of this world. And I need more things and things and things. And we're in love with the things of this world. Earth instead of the God who created everything. Lukewarm Christians, are, they're more consumed with this world than they are eternity to come. Number five, lukewarm Christians only turn to God when they need something. Oh, they'll turn to God. I mean, we'll do that, won't we? But when things are going good, who really needs God? I mean, the weather's out, our kids are healthy, nobody's fighting, we've got money to pay the bills, you know, everything's good. And whoops, somebody's got cancer. So we pull out the God tool out of our toolbox. Oh, yeah, God, we've got someone who got cancer, we need you. Okay, okay, chemotherapy work, don't need you now, put God aside. Everything's good, everything's good, everything's good. Uh-oh, my kids are having trouble. Pull God out of the toolbox, God, I need you again. Oh, we believe in God, and we'll use him for our benefit but we're not in a daily relationship with him because a lukewarm Christian will call on God only when they need something. Number six, the lukewarm Christian will give whenever it's convenient. I'll, I'll give if I look good. I'll give if it doesn't impinge on my standard of, of living. I'll give if I want to, uh, but oh my gosh, don't, don't you dare ask me to do something I don't want to do. Don't push me. Why? Because this is my stuff, my money, my things, my, 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 the committed follower of Jesus realizes it's God's, 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 but the lukewarm Christian says, mine, 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 mine. And we don't like to talk about that kind of stuff because that's my business and not yours. Stay out of that subject. And number seven, the lukewarm Christian, honestly, they are not much different from the rest of the world. They're not that much different from other people. Let's be honest. The lukewarm Christian watches the same movies as everybody else listens to the same music as everybody else, uses the same filthy language on the golf course when the ball goes in the grass as everybody else. They have the same morals as everybody else. They raise their kids kind of like everybody else. They get divorced just as often as everybody else. Why? Because we just like everybody else. It's, it's comfortable Christianity. It's comfortable. It's, it's I, I, I want all of what God has for me, but I don't want to follow what he wants me to do. I want enough of Jesus to, to get me into heaven and to keep me out of hell, but not so much of Jesus that it makes me into one of those people that are fully consumed with all that spiritual stuff. And Jesus calls this kind of person lukewarm, and it makes him want to vomit. He, he cannot stomach it. It repulses him. And one of the reasons why I can kind of pinpoint with some accuracy what a lukewarm Christian looks like is because there have been times in my relationship with Jesus when I've been very, very lukewarm. Okay? And I'll open up to you and tell you about one of the darkest times kind of in my spiritual journey. Um, when I became a Christian, I was like on fire, like nobody's business, obnoxious, wearing Jesus shirts that, that looked like Coca-Cola, Jesus Christ, he's the real thing. I had a Jesus watch with that old blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus on a watch. You didn't even know they had those watches. That's how crazy I was, Jesus watch, okay? I mean, I'm all in. And then I got um, hired on as an associate pastor uh, under my pastor, Nick Harris, at First United Methodist Church in downtown Oklahoma City. It was my dream come true. My goodness, I get to serve God full time and ministry. And I just visualized this is going to be amazing Bible studies every day. And we're going to walk in and like holy music's going to be playing and the presence of God's going to be swirling around this place. And my Bible will probably hover up above the <laughs> desk. And when I, when I, you know, it'll turn magically and sermons will write themselves and, and people will be loving and they're all nice because they're church people, right? All church people are nice, right? And I didn't realize that it was a job. 
you know, and like you had to work, and, and, you know, it was hard work. And what happened to me is, tragically, I let the ministry work replace my relationship with God. Um, one of my heroes, Bill Hybels, who's a mentor to me, said one time, he said, the way I was doing the work of God destroyed the work of God in me. And that's, that's what happened to me. The way I was doing the work of God destroyed the work of God in me. And I honestly, I would read the Bible to preach, not for personal devotion. I, there was a time I honestly think I probably prayed as much or more publicly as I did privately. And that wasn't a lot. You, know, you get up and you do the pastoral prayer. And I would tell people, you know, I'm, I'm praying for you, praying for you, praying for you. But I rarely did. It just, it was, I was, I was, I had the show on the outside, but inside I was very hollow. And the phrase that came to me when I kind of realized this, I felt almost like God showed me this, but it, the phrase was, you become a full-time pastor and a part-time follower of Jesus. A full-time pastor and a part-time follower of Jesus. And I recognize that at all of our churches, there are very few of you who are pastors or in, in you know, vocational ministry, but that phrase could very well hit many of you that you become a full-time mom and a part-time follower of Jesus, okay? Or you're a full-time business person and a part-time follower of Jesus. Oh, you're, you're a full-time student and a part-time follower of Jesus. And I woke up and I was the great oxymoron, a lukewarm Christian. Not hot, not cold, just comfortable, complacent in my relationship with Jesus. And tragically, that's where so many people are. And I, I have some theories that it's actually far easier to be a lukewarm Christian where I live than in many parts of the world. And I'll tell you why. I, in fact, it's so easy to be a Christian where I live that it's almost difficult to be a true one. And I want to say that again because I want it to sink in. It's so easy to be a Christian where I live. And I understand that at many of our life churches, the context is different in the, in the Northeast, in the Southeast. It's different in New Mexico. And, and kind of in the Bible Belt, it's so expected to be a Christian here. It's so easy to be a Christian here that it's almost difficult to be a true one. The good news is there are places all over the world that when you are a follower of Jesus, it means something because it will cost you. It could cost you your job. It, it, could cost you, uh, it could cost you your reputation. There are places in the world, as we know, it could cost you your head, right? It could cost you your life. And, and as horrible as that is, there's almost a blessing in that persecution because when you're persecuted, you become stronger. And when suddenly, like even in my part of the world, as it's starting to become a little more difficult to be a Christian, where people are starting to push back and starting to hate and, and, and really even more criticize, suddenly it makes you either say, you know what, I'm in or I'm not. And when you're in, you're in. And when you recognize what Jesus really did for you, and it means something, you cannot be lukewarm. And I know right now there are those of you in countries around the world at church online, when you say the name of Jesus, it means something. When you meet another brother or sister in Christ, you are not fighting with them because you need them to survive. And as it becomes even more difficult where I live, my theory is that the true church will be strengthened and people will take a, a, a stance. Either I'm, oh, no, 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 I'm not going that far, or you know what? Yes, I do believe, and I want to fully commit my life to the one who gave it all to me. And Jesus was talking directly into... He was talking directly into a culture that is so similar to ours today. Worldly wealth, theaters, shopping centers, stadiums. We have so much in so many parts of our world that it's almost like you don't feel like you need God. He said this, he said, you say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I don't need a thing. But you don't realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Now, here's a Christian. A quote question. Was he talking to Christians or not? Were they, he, he said lukewarm. He didn't say lukewarm Christian. We added that phrase. He's talking to those who are lukewarm. Were the lukewarm followers of Jesus or not? You tell me. Here's what he calls them. Wretched. 
that doesn't sound real Christian. Pitiful, poor, blind, or naked. And about, about right now, if God is doing what God does so lovingly, there are those of you that are feeling the gentle conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, and you're recognizing, maybe I believe in God, but I don't really know him because I'm not fully committed to him, okay? What do you do if that's you? Let me tell you, really simple. Open the door to your heart and invite Jesus in. It's that simple. Open up the door to your heart and say, Jesus, come into my life, come in now. Because this is what Jesus said in verse 20. I want to look at it again. He said, here I am. I stand at the door. I'm here. If you'll open up, I'm ready to come in. If anyone hears my voice, hey, it's me, Jesus. I love you. I, I want to come in. I gave my life for you. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person today with me. Here's the thing. You don't have to get cleaned up first. You don't have to make your life right first. You don't have to get all perfect first. You let him in. Jesus, come 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 in. And that's what he does. He comes in right as you are, as you are. And he loves you because that's what he came to do. And he accepts you, but he does not leave you there. He transforms you, and suddenly your sins are forgiven, and you are no longer the same. You become a new creation in Christ. All the old is gone, and everything becomes new. And there are those of you, hear his voice. Hear his voice. Let him in. He's knocking, he's knocking, he's knocking, and he's simply wants to come in, if you hear his voice and open up your life, Jesus will come in. For those of you who say, well, I've done that, I, 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 I know him, but oh, I'm comfortable. Oh, I'm complacent. What do you do? Let me tell you what you do. When I come home and open up the door, and one of my little kids are excited to see me because the bigger ones aren't as excited as they used to be. Okay? <laughs> when one of my smaller children, they're excited to see me, what do they do? Daddy's home, what do they do? Run to the door! <laughs> Boom, daddy's home! Lift them up and we snuggle like crazy. Here's what you do. You recognize Jesus is still there and you just run to him and that's what you do. You just run to him right now. That's what you do. You just pursue him right now. That's what you do. You just tell him, I want you. I want to be close to you. I need you because when you seek him, you will find him. He has not left you. He is there and you just run to him. What do you do? If you recognize you don't know him, you just listen for that voice and you open your heart up to him. And for those of you who do know him, but your love has grown cold, what do you do? You just run to him today because your heavenly father loves you and he loves when his children comes to him and he's ready to embrace him and therefore you pursue him because when you know who he is and you know what he's done then you crave acceptance from him and you don't need acceptance from this world and suddenly you share your faith all the time because you know that Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. And you know that him, in him through the cross there is the forgiveness of sins. And suddenly you recognize that what you own is not your own. You see it as a tool for God to use to make a difference in this world. And you don't rationalize sin, you confess it quickly. And you ask the Holy Spirit to transform you. Why? Because you're being conformed into the image of Christ. And you don't live for this world because this world is not your home. You're an ambassador of the highest ranking diplomat sent by God from heaven to this earth and you are on a mission and there is no part of you that will cause God to puke because you're on fire and you are on fire and he loves when you pursue him. So, tragically we live in a world where there are many people today who are comfortable in their Christianity. Now, I believe in God, but I don't want to do all that Jesus, you know, go, 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 go stuff. Like, I'm not that born again type. I'm, I'm, I'm more of the, I'm more of the, you know, I want what he has for me, but, but let's call it good there. Okay? When you recognize who he is, 
and you recognize what he has done, that God became flesh in the person of Jesus and gave his life so that we could live, your only reasonable response is all of me, all of me. Because you gave your life for me, I choose to give my life for you. I'm all in. There's going to come a time, mark my words, when you have to make a decision, you enter you out. Those who are followers of Jesus, they will be strengthened and say, I want to follow him with all of my heart, with all of my life, because he gave his life for me. Father, I pray today that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would strengthen our church, that God, where there are pockets of those who are lukewarm, in a world where it is so easy to be distracted by the theaters and the stadiums and the shopping malls and all of the stuff that um, promises to fill us yet leaves us empty. God, we choose to run to you at the door and ask for your grace and your presence. God, we want to be in a living relationship with you that we would know you and pursue you with all of our hearts. And all of our churches, as you're praying right now, I'm just gonna ask it as directly as I can. And those of you who would say, yes, I understand who Jesus is, and at some point I committed to be his disciple, I wanted to glorify him with everything in me, and yet right now I see areas of my life that are lukewarm, and the Holy Spirit is convicting me, and I want those areas to be hot with passion to please and serve him. Would you lift up your hands high right now? Be really honest. All of our churches, just lift up your hands. God, I thank you today for so many people who are under the loving conviction of your spirit that transforms us. And God, I thank you that we are not the same when you move us by your spirit to know you more intimately. God, we give you permission and ask you to continue to show us, reveal to us any area of our lives where we might be deceived, selling out for something less than what you want for us. God, we ask for forgiveness, and we ask that the power of the Holy Spirit would stir within us, that we would never be lukewarm, that we would be white hot with passion to please you in all that we do. God, I thank you that because of this moment in your presence, that there are people who would eternally be different because your spirit is working, your voice is speaking, and God, you are transforming us to make us into the image of your son, Jesus. Have your perfect way, God. We don't want to be comfortable. We want to walk by faith and not by sight. We want to please you, God, in all that we do.